Hey folks, back again with another vlog. This is a commission video for uh, Art Tarnotow. Nowtow? Not sure how to pronounce his name. Narut? Um, apologies for mispronouncing your name, Arthur. Um, anyway, um, this is a vlog for a movie called Song of the Sea, uh, which is a uh, co-production between a bunch of countries, but primarily Ireland. Uh, that apparently came out in 2015 and was nominated for an Academy Award and uh, kind of like Mary and Max, completely flew under my radar. Didn't hear a word about it. Um, and I'm really sorry about that because it was really good. Um, it, you know, so, uh, given its limited release, just a really quick summary of what it's about. Um, boy named Ben, his mother uh, disappears when he's a small child, uh, apparently having died in childbirth, giving birth to his sister, Sir, uh, Saoirse. Uh, which, by the way, thank you, movie, for teaching me how to pronounce that name, which I've only ever seen written down. Uh, it's Saoirse. Searsha. Um, they get, t uh, you know, jump to six years later, uh, Searsha can't talk, and uh, one night she goes up into the attic or whatever and finds a chest which contains uh, a sealskin coat which she puts on and goes down to the water and turns into a seal and starts swimming with the seals because this is a variant on the Selkie myth. Um, it's an interesting variant. It's not one I've encountered before. The standard Selkie myth is uh, a man, you know, a Selkie comes to land. Um, Selkies, if you're not familiar, by the way, are an Irish legend of uh, women who turn into seals or seals that turn into women more accurately. Um, they can come up on land and shed their seal skins and become women, and the seal skin takes the form of a coat, and then they can put on that coat and become a seal again when they go in the water. Um, typically, in the Selkie stories I've seen, a man takes the coat and locks it away, and the Selkie is forced to become his bride because uh, magic... For some reason, fairy tales about magical form-changing women come in exactly two flavors. Rape-tastic, and she's evil and preying on the man. Uh, yay! But regardless, um, she's forced to become his bride, and then uh, at, she sets rules. And at some point, he will inevitably break those rules or she will be able to get a hold of the co coat in some way, and then she runs away and never returns. Optionally, takes the children with her. This was definitely not like those stories. Um, for starters, we see right from the start of the movie, when we see the mom, she's wearing the long white coat, the seal coat. Um, it hasn't been locked away from her, which very strongly implies that she's there willingly, which is a nice change. Um, this appears to be more of a case of, you know, she fell in love with a human man, and they married and had children. And, but for whatever reason, she, she's able to give birth to Ben just fine, but Sir, she, uh, she has problems. And, uh, anyway, uh, Sir, she goes down to the sea, she goes swimming around, uh, her grandmother finds her. Her grandmother is portrayed as a rather crotchety old woman who uh, thinks she knows best for everyone and takes the children away from the sea, inland to the city, uh, because she thinks that Sersha, you know, went out in the middle of the night and nearly drowned. Uh, they then have an adventure coming back. Uh, in which Sersha is getting sicker and sicker, and they have to deal with this evil witch that turns people to stone by stealing their feelings, or, excuse me, turns fairies to stone by stealing their fi their feelings. Um, and in the end, uh, they're briefly reunited with their mother, 
help all the fairies leave this world and go to a Tiernanog, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right at all. Um, and then uh, Sersha is half human, so she gets to choose whether to go or stay, and she elects to stay. Uh, really fast summary of the movie. It was not a plot-driven movie. This was not a movie at all about the plot. The plot was exactly what you would expect. Like, every story beat was completely predictable significantly in advance. But that's because that's not the kind of story this is. You know, this isn't a mystery. This isn't a, uh, you know, suspense thriller or anything where, you know, surprise, you know, this isn't a horror movie. This isn't something where surprising the audience is what it's for. Um, this is a fairy tale. And fairy tales, a lot of their power comes from familiarity rather than novelty. Uh, they come from familiar old elements being arranged in new ways, like taking the familiar tale of the Selkie and making her there willingly. Uh, but she still has to leave um, in the end. Uh, the one thing that wasn't, could have been a little clearer is exactly why, um, Saoirse started getting sick. Um, was it just the thing that Selkies can only spend a certain amount of time on land? Uh, for that matter, why did the mom get sick? Is, you know, can Selkies only spend a certain amount of time on land and then they have to go? Or was it something to do with the fact that, uh, Saoirse is a Selkie and Ben isn't? Uh, presumably because every Selkie we ever hear about is a girl and that's a boy. Um, like, did she have to go back to the water to give birth to Saoirse, and then for whatever reason she couldn't come back, only, only Saoirse could? Um, that's a little unclear, but that's not really important. Um, there's a lot to love about this movie. Um, it looks amazing. It looks like a storybook come to life. Apparently, I did a little reading on it after I watched it, uh, which is how I know it was nominated for an Academy Award and all that stuff, and apparently it was uh, hand-drawn. I know, in 2015, or 2014. Um, it was hand-drawn, which nobody does anymore, and it was beautiful. I did not realize how much I missed 2D movies. Uh, 2D animated movies until I watched this. Um, you know, there's a lot to be said for the use of CGI in movies nowadays. It has a lot of advantages. There's reasons they do it so much. But at the same time, there's, you know, the things you can do in 2D. You can be I mean, there's no particular reason you couldn't do this in 3D that I know of, but in 2D you can be very impressionistic. Um, and that's really what it felt like. It, it felt like, you know, not quite an impressionist painting, but it felt like a painting come to life. It felt like the illustrations in a storybook. Um, only they were moving. Um... There's, like, at, near the beginning, there's a beautiful sequence where it, like, shows the backstory with the mom and all, and then it pulls back, and the story is playing in, like, this increasingly small window while there's this, like, complicated pattern all around it, uh, which is static. And it feels like you've opened a page in a storybook and in the cent like something in the center of the uh, illustration is starting to move. Uh, it's, it's magical, is the only word for it. Um, and I don't feel like anything animated, like anything CGI has accomplished that kind of magic yet that I know of. Um, there's one thing this did which I don't think a CGI movie could do, which is there are basically no straight lines in the entire movie. Um, everything curves. Roads wind across rolling hills. 
gates are made of bent piping or you know other materials where there's no straight lines everything is flowing um which befits the very ocean theme nature of it um everything is flowing everything is curved you look at uh the characters and you know like noses are two curves that meet at a point and faces are all round and eyes are round and you know Everything is, is the, you know, uh, Saoirse is this, you know, perfectly round head on, like, a rounded triangle body. Um, ben is a little bit narrower, but still very rounded. Um, and, you know, the polygon-based nature of CGI, uh, those movies tend to have more straight lines in them. Uh, which, which, it was nice. It was very different look from most animated movies that are out nowadays. And I definitely appreciate that. Um, the color palette was also wonderful. It was all done, practically the entire movie was done in blues and greens, which uh, when Maka the witch shows up, it makes the yellow of her eyes just pop. And the, uh, you know, when she gets angry later on, that's all these reds and yellows that, like, colors that you've barely seen all movie. Um, it, it just becomes a very intense moment as a consequence. Uh, the same with the kind of warm yellows of the uh, fairies when they're departing. You know, normally these warmer colors are homey, you know, because it's it's firelight and most, you know, light bulbs in houses have a yellowish tint to them. Um, and we just think of like yellowish, you know, just a little bit yellowish and reddish as being warm. I and mean, those are warm colors. And hence we associate them with home. Whereas like blues and greens are, you know, ocean, they're ice, they're moonlight. They're, you know, normally, like, if you're going to show something as home versus otherworldly, you'd use the warmer colors for home and the cooler colors for the, for the other world. This movie does the exact opposite. Um, the, it's the warmer colors that are a little bit out of place, a little bit eerie, but at the same time, they're inviting and homey, uh, which helps make the fairy world feel like a warm and beautiful place. Like when we finally see Tiranog, uh, we don't really see it, we just see kind of this yellow glow with a suggestion of a skyline that looks like, you know, fantastic castles and so forth. Um, when we see like the orangey sunset sort of colors of the fairies departing, it's it feels like coming home. It puts us more in the emotional register of the fairies. Um, it also helps uh, make make it feel like a sunset, even though it's happening in the middle of the night. Um, it feels like a sunset, which which is to say, you know, they're departing, they're ending. The last bits of that world are going away. The sun is setting on them. Mm. And it ties in with, at the beginning, they use a bit um, of the Yeats poem, The Stolen Child, uh, which I went through, like, this weird Yeats phase in college, and I only remember bits and pieces of it, but I definitely recognized what they were saying. And it was very interesting, because in the Yeats poem, when you read it in context, it's very clear that this is a fairy calling to a child to lure them away. Um, you know, this is the changeling story, where the fairies lure the child away, and the child is never seen again, or is replaced with a changeling. Um, and, you know, the result is tragedy, you have a lost child, and, um, you know, the fairies might... You know, it's effectively the child has died. Um, they're gone from this world. And... Here they make it 
much less of an eerie, creepy thing, and more just, you know, wanting to protect the child, wanting the child to be happy, because, as they say, this world is more full of sorrow than you'll ever understand. But, as we see with Maka later in the movie, um, there's such things as being too protective, and I love that Maka is designed to look like, voiced by the same actress as, and has the same music and some of the same de decorations in her home as the grandmother. Um, it, you know, for a second I was worried there were, that it was going to be kind of like the Wizard of Oz thing where they, you know, we can't actually have a fantasy story. We must make it turn out to be a dream that's populated with the people that, you know, the character knows in real life. But thankfully they did not do that. It was just there to make the parallels explicit that, you know, this is someone who thinks they know best for everyone else. This is someone who is invasively protective, mm, helping you against your will, doing things that you don't actually want them to do um, in the name of protecting you because they think they know better than you. It, there's an arrogance there. But at the same time, Maka is ultimately made to be kind of a tragic figure. There are no real villains in this story. There are only people who make bad choices for sympathetic reasons. Uh, which is always a plus in my book. Um, I definitely prefer stories like that to ones where the lines are more sharply drawn. Um, which ties into the visual style of having very thin outlines and almost no straight lines, um, and having these kind of watercolor-esque or painting-like uh, backgrounds and, you know, the way in which things are colored in. It's... Like I said, it's a really beautiful movie and really comes together in, in a very integrated way. Um, every element of it works with every other element. Um, you know, the music, the song that is integrated directly into the story and, you know, becomes this important part of it. Uh, the way that, you know, a couple of the human characters, not all of them, but a couple of the human characters have counterparts among the fairies. Um, the, the two I noticed being, uh, I already talked about Maka and the grandmother, and also um, the Shinaki, is that what he was called? Um, the, there was a fairy who had this incredibly long beard and every hair in it represented a story. The Shinaki? Um, I think the great Shinaki, um, which, if I remember right, a Shinaki is a kind of storyteller, I think. Anyway, um, his, he was, had a very similar character design to and was based on, like, the same voice actor as the old man that runs the ferry. Um, which is delicious for my liminal space-loving self, because, of course, uh, what does a fairy do? It carries you across the liminal space. Um, that's why more than one culture has a ferryman um, who carries, the, you know, carries you across into death, which is, you know, the ultimate transition across a liminal space is the space, the ultimate liminal space is the one between life and death. Um, but fairy tales are all about liminal space. They're all about worlds blending into one another because there's fairy and there's the day-to-day -day world. And there are certain places and times and behaviors where they're linked. Um, via liminal space. You don't find fairies, you know, walking down Main Street. You find them along the seashore, liminal space. You find them on roads, liminal space. You find them in the forests, liminal space. Um, you find them in, and I love this idea of the movie hack, you find them in a roundabout. 
Because, of course, a roundabout is something no one ever goes to. It's a space you go through that connects other spaces. Um, it's a perfect place to find fairies. Um, it makes total sense that they'd live in one. So I don't know if that's actually, like, an Irish thing, now that there are roundabouts in Ireland, if, if there are stories about fairies living in them, or if it's something this movie made up. But either way, it's perfect. It makes absolute sense. Um, and, you know, emotionally the movie worked. I knew exactly what was coming beat by beat in the climax of the movie. Um, and I still got a lump in my throat when uh, the mother reappeared to say goodbye and so she chose not to go with the fairies. Um, it was exactly what I expected to happen and I still like with the music and the way it's drawn and I just it got me and it was well done it's you know I, it's difficult to point to any actual flaws in this movie um, the only one I can think of is that the mom sort of gets fridged but then she really doesn't um, you know, because she's not really dead. Um, she's removed from the narrative for most of it, but she does return at the end. Um, so, yeah, um, other than that, uh, incredibly solid movie really beautifully animated, uh, beautiful music, beautiful story, just a fairy tale you can immerse yourself in for an hour and a half. Uh, there are far worse things in this world. So again, thank you very much for getting me to watch this, Arthur. Um, I enjoyed it immensely, and yeah, I will see all of you next time. Bye.